I'm Dylan Hamilton, and I've been working uh, with Dr. Nala Pradal, um, with under Dr. Jan, Jan's group. Um, and I actually had two projects. This is my main one, and then there's a little side project just at the very end. So um, my main project is the atomic layer deposition of tin oxide. And um, I know we've gone through this a thousand times, so I'll just zip through our anatomy of a thin film solar cell. Um, you have sunlight coming from the top, you have your glass, um, your TCO, um, which is actually comprised of uh, multiple parts. So if you split that into its respective parts, then you also have the HRT uh, buffer layer, which stands for highly resistive transparent. Um, and that's the layer that I was working on. Uh, and then you have your PN junction and your back contact. Um, so we currently receive glass coated with both of these two layers um, directly from, from the manufacturer. And so the question is, um, is there any efficiency to be gained from uh, depositing this HRT layer ourselves, being able to tune it um, to our specifications, um, and, and do we get an efficiency from that? Um, so that is our goal, to deposit our tin oxide as our buffer layer. Um, and to understand the need for a buffer layer, we need to understand the role of CAD sulfide in the cell as a whole. Um, and so it is, it is the window layer um, that you need to, it, it, it's the end type of the PN junction. So you need it to create your um, electric field through here. Um, but what you don't want it doing is to absorb a lot of photons uh, because it has uh, very low carrier lifetimes. And so if it's absorbing all the photons up here, they're going to recombine. Uh, the photons aren't going to make it to the CAD cal and the, the electrons and holes that are created here um, have, a, have a higher chance of recombination, which won't give you any electricity. So you don't want that. Um, so we achieve, uh, so, we, so we don't want it to be absorbing photons, and so we do that by making it very thin. The problem is if you make it very thin, um, you start getting non-uniformity, such as pinholes, um, and that can allow um, copper atoms from the back contact to migrate up through the CAD cal, through the pinholes and the CAD sulfide, and then touch your TCO, which is basically just shorting out your solar cell. Um, so you don't want that either. Um, so that's why you're, you need a highly resistive transparent buffer layer to keep those copper atoms from shunting your cell. Um, so reduces shunting. Because of this decreased shunting, we, it enables us to use a thinner cad sulfide layer. And uh, this, then the cad sulfide will absorb less light, allowing it to go through to the absorber layer of the cad tail, leading to greater efficiency. So that is why we need a buffer layer. Um, so how are we depositing this buffer layer? Um, by using atomic layer deposition, which is characterized by these uh, key words down here, um, sequential and especially self-limiting. So uh, it's the, the, the precursors we use are such a way that once it reacts on all possible sites of one layer, it can't react anymore. So this is great because we pump in our uh, first precursor, it reacts completely, can't react anymore, so we just pump it out, pump in our second precursor, reacts completely, can't react anymore, pump it out. That's one cycle, and we do this 500 to you know, 1,500 times. Um, and it's growing up layer by layer. Um, and so this leads to very nice uniform films. Um, so here is our uh, device. That's our chamber right there that we're using to deposit the tin outside. Um, and we're using this precursor called Petrachus dimethylamine 10. Um, our substrate is soda lime glass, and then we have these parameters that we can change that will change the properties of our film. So we can change the pulse time of our precursors, the temperatures, um, if we're using <coughs> water or ozone to uh, react with, and in a number of cycles we'll change the thickness. Um, and our target is to get a high transmission because we don't want it absorbing photons before the photons get to the CAD tail layer. Uh, and then we want a carrier concentration on the order of magnitude 10 to the 17th, 10 to the 18th per cubic centimeter. And we want a thickness of somewhere between 50 to 100 nanometers. Um, so we have some pretty cool results so far. Um, this is uh, the effect of deposition temperature on transmission. Um, so we want a high transmission. And as you can see, as we go up uh, with uh, uh, so 
substrate temperature, we get higher transmissions, especially above about 400 uh, nanometers. So um, that's a good find. Um, and now comes the really interesting part, I think, um, because really in the literature that I found, I really couldn't find much about the effect of annealing on, on bubble layers. Um, and so we decided to try annealing, and we saw some pretty substantial gains in transmission. I mean, here this is a 10% gain in transmission. Over here is about 5% um, just from uh, the red is as deposited. Um, so just from some annealing in an argon ambient. Um, and uh, the annealing also had a very substantial contribution to carrier concentration. So as deposited, we were having a lot of trouble because our carrier concentrations were down here in the 10 to the 13th um, range. And once we anneal, it shoots up to 10 to the 18th, 10 to the 19th, um, which is good. It's a little bit high, actually. It's even a little bit high. Remember, we're trying to go for 10 to the 17, 10 to the 18. Um, so now, do we have our buffer layer perfectly characterized? No. But um, it is important to sandwich it into our cell because you really don't know exactly how it's going to work until you put it in between the layers. Um, because you know things can happen in your cell that don't don't happen just on your plain substrate. You know there can be unintentional dopants stuff like that through the treatment process. So we created a control and our custom HRT layer, and these are exactly the same, except for that with the control, we use the Pilkington um, buffer layer on the Tech 15, um, which is 100 nanometers thick, and then for our custom HRT, we did the ALD of 10 oxide, uh, which is 100 and, uh, 1,500 cycles, uh, with a subject temperature of 200 degrees, um, and then with the annealing of five minutes, uh, at 500 degrees Celsius in argon. Um, and our lab uh, has a historic efficiency of around 15%. So how did we do? Well, we did get 15% on the control, and we got about an average of 1% uh, lower in ours. So there's obviously still a lot of work to be done. Um, the uh, short circuit current is actually doing pretty okay. The fill factor and the open circuit voltage, on the other hand, are doing pretty poorly compared to the control, so uh, that needs addressing. Um, and then uh, we take the individual cells, so you deposit it and you get a bunch of different cells, and then we take, this is, these are the results, so these are averages for all those different cells. Now this is our best cell of, on the control and on the uh, buffer layer one. And our JV curve, you can see that on the current density side, it's doing just fine. But then we have this big decline on the voltage side. So um, that, we're definitely losing some efficiency there. And then you look at our quantum efficiency, and we actually have a slightly higher one in the blue side, which is surprising because we have the same had sulfide thickness, supposedly. <laughs> and, um, and then you have a little decrease here in the longer wavelengths. So uh, we need to fix that in the future. Um, so in the future, I think uh, one thing is we need more precise thickness measurements. We've been using a profilometer to do thickness measurements. Um, and the, the tin oxide is very hard. Um, so you, you scratch it with a razor blade, and you're never sure if you're really quite going through it all or if you're taking some glass with it. So it's a very, it's not very exact way of doing things. Um, and so I think that this definitely needs better uh, precision, the thickness. Um, literature citing best HRT thicknesses between 50 and 150 nanometers. Um, the Tech 15, which is our control, is at 100 nanometers. And our film thickness is at least 150 nanometers, but I'm pretty sure it's thicker than that. Um, so it's definitely on the high end, but we need to know exactly what it is if we're really going to get this um, down to the science, if you will. <laughs> um, so ellipsometry could be used rather than a uh, profilometer uh, could lead to better precision. Uh, we also need um, further investigation into the ALD deposition because we're still not able to reproduce the results in the literature. Uh, they report higher carrier concentrations before annealing than we've been able to get. Um, and we don't know why that is. And then thirdly, 
Uh, we also need to investigate more into annealing. Um, again, I didn't see much of this in the literature with regards to buffer layers specifically. Um, so um, I think some more investigation of that could be good. Um, and also, we, it actually led to too high carrier concentrations. Um, so maybe you know we need to maybe decrease the time or maybe the temperature to get it down a little bit um, to where we want the carrier concentrations. <coughs> um, so that's the end of the very first section. And now there's just a very quick uh, side project I did. And this was with the mentor, uh, Corey Greif, um, synthesis of copper barium tin sulfide. Um, and copper barium tin sulfide is from the same 1, 2, 4, 6 class of materials as copper zinc tin sulfide, uh, which is an emerging absorber layer semiconductor um, composed of earth abundant and non toxic elements. Um, so the idea is if you know, we can get this to be good, it, it's possible that it could res uh, um, replace CAD TEP as the absorber layer. So we need to evaluate this other one, copper barium tin sulfide, um, whether it has any potential as an absorber layer. And so we're attempting this synthesis via solid state reaction in an evacuated ampule at 500 degrees Celsius. And this is on a time scale. I mean, we put it in an oven and basically bake it for, um, we did a week for this past synthesis. And so this is our, our crystal that we're trying to create. And um, so far, uh, you can see the change in the powder. This is before and this is after. So you get a big color change. So something's happening, so that's exciting. Um, we don't have any large crystals yet, but we were able to do a powder um, X-ray diffraction. And you can see, well, maybe you can't see. It's not great resolution. But um, we get a very good fit um, if we try to fit our X-ray diffraction curve to four phases that are up here. Um, so the majority of our powder is what we want, which is exciting, it's copper bearing tin sulfide, that's 82%. Um, and then the rest, 18%, is other phases that we don't want. Um, but you know, for a first try, that's pretty cool. Um, and so in the future, we're going to try a longer annealing time to hopefully um, get a single large crystal, and then we'll be able to do some cool tests on that. Uh, so that's everything. I'd like to thank first and foremost Dr. Nao Paudel. Um, has really helped amazingly throughout the um, 10 weeks here. Um, I'd also like to thank Dr. Yan and the members of his research group. Um, I'd like to thank Corey Grice for helping with the synthesis. Um, uh, Michael Bowman for um, basically I did the HRT layer and then once you compile the whole cell, the CAD sulfide, the CAD tel, the CAD chloride treatment, etc., that's what he does. So he did all that for me. <laughs> that's great and showed me. Um, so thank you to Michael. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Richard Irving for all the work you do um, to make this RE possible. And last but not least, Linda Obi, um, the administrative coordinator for all the work she does um, to make this possible. So thank you. Any questions for Dylan? Yes. So you can open the last uh, the x-ray, outer x-ray pattern. I was a little confused. I see two curves, purple, brown. Oh, okay. So the very underlying kind of dark purple curve is the experimental data. This lighter blue one is the fit. Um, or is the sorry? Is the lighter blue one is the like calibration? The, if we had perfectly, you know, eighty-two percent, two percent, eight percent, eight percent, then it would look like this lighter blue data. And so this red one is, if it were perfectly flat, we'd get a perfect fit between these four phases. And so this noise around it is saying that we don't have, you know, 100%. Oh, it's like a deviation between the two. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, could, could you just say again, what is the, what was the specific difference between your control set in the, in the previous project, the control cell and, uh, and, and the other tested one? With the results or the the that we make? Uh, no, just with, with what you make. Yeah, this is okay. Sit on to it. Yeah. yeah. So, so it, if I may, just yeah, that. absolutely. Um, so the control one is just the commercially available mm -hmm. Tech 15. Tech 15. And then the comparison you make is it just a single layer of fluorine to oxide followed by the HRT? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. 
exactly right. So, and the HRT is the one that we do. Yes? How many samples of the first do you have of the Tech 15? Uh, oh, so we actually only did one run of the completed cell. Um, <laughs> so that also needs more work. <laughs> we need to do more runs. Um, so this is the only control we have. Right now. So that would explain the slight difference from 15%. Yeah. <coughs> yes. When you say the test cell, is it one of the small die-casted little tiny cells, or is it like a, what is the surface area of the actual tested? Okay, uh, so for these, um, we have, you know, a three by three inch okay. uh, substrate, and then we have a bunch of little circular cells in there, and so these are average. Average, yeah. um, this is the, sorry. This is the average value, max value, min value, first and second, first and third quartile. And then for these, we have the best cell in that block. Block, okay. That we do these individual tests on. So you have lots of samples. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. only yeah. one run of yeah. yeah. Is there any more questions? All right. Let's thank Dylan again.